right, welcome to Compassion Sunday. Are you awake? Yeah. Amen. Hey, I am so excited about this brand new ministry because it may be a new ministry partner to Green Acres, but this is building on a foundation that has been going on since 1955, all right? I mean, so we're just continuing to build on uh, the foundation of compassion that has already been placed inside of you by the Spirit of God himself, but then through the ministry efforts of this church body. I mean, this has been going on a long time. I mean, you think about all the things that God has been doing through our Kenyan girls ministry, uh, through uh, our shower trailer, and just our response team with Texas Baptist men, and all of these things that happen around right here locally, and then across the states, and then across the seas. I mean, just think about this. Uh, this church body just gave almost $1.2 million in our uh, world mission offering. I thought you would be excited. Maybe I guess you'll be excited if it's $2 million next year. I don't know. All right, listen, I don't know what's going to make you happy, okay? But that's a big deal. Why? Because it's in your heart to do what God is calling us to do, no matter what it takes, no matter the cost. We just sang that, didn't we? Do you really believe that this morning? I will do whatever it takes, no matter the cost, to make the name of Jesus known around the world. Who's in on that? Yeah. Right? You know, it's interesting to me because you see specific instructions about how we should live out our lives while we are waiting on the return of Jesus Christ. I mean, it's very clear. First John, all of the New Testament, the Old Testament, but specifically even in the Gospels of Matthew. I mean, think about the Gospel of Matthew just for a moment. Even in, in Jesus' inaugural sermon, as he is opening up on the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6, he is talking about this upside-down way of thinking about how to live your life. He says things like, you have heard it said in this way, but I say to you, this, right? He's turning our understanding upside down because he said, look, this is what it looks like to belong to the kingdom of God. But then a, a post-resurrection uh, Jesus continues the same understanding with his disciples to help them understand this is what it looks like to follow after me. This is what it looks like to live as if you are a part of my kingdom. He even gives us more detailed instructions in Matthew chapter 25. And I just want to read this to us so that we can understand what is going on um, right here in Matthew chapter 25. It says this in verse 35. It says, for I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you, a stranger, and take you in, or without clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, whatever you did, for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. You know, this begs the question for us, okay, then who is Jesus referring to? 
who are the least of these? Because don't you think that it would be wise of us that as Jesus explains right here in Matthew 25, that there will be a day, there will be a time that you and I stand before God himself and not only give an account of what we do with the good news of Jesus, with salvation, but we will give an account for what we do with our salvation. Meaning that you are not just saved from something, you are saved for something. You are saved so that you may live out the spirit of God. You may live out the kingdom values that Jesus himself established for you and I to walk in. Don't you think that if the church at large would wake up spiritually in such a way that nothing could deter us from being this laser focused on the mission of God. What do you think would happen? You think revival would tarry? Don't you think that we would usher in seeds of revival? Maybe we would usher in the fire from heaven to awaken every wicked heart that is here on earth. Don't you think that we would be a part of something like that? And then I would ask, don't you want to be? Don't you want to be a part of a earth-shaking, earth-shattering, heart-piercing movement of the Spirit of God that when we pray that we could feel the heat of the fires of heaven coming down upon us? Don't you want that to be your life? Amen. Here's what happens with revival, just in your own heart. Because I'm begging for the Spirit of God to just give me that revival. God, don't ever let me lose focus of the mission. Because what happens when revival sets into your own heart is that your desires become bent toward the desires of God. And what would happen if our hearts were aligned and in tune with the heart of God. What would be different about your life? What would be different about my life? The, the moments that I miss just being out of tune from the Spirit of God, the moments that I miss because I'm more concerned about the, my own personal desires than the desires of God. Well, how do we know what the heart of God is? How do we know what God is after. Well, he's very clear in scripture. First of all, the only time we see something about the heart of Christ or the heart of God is when Jesus describes it. He says, for I am lowly and gentle at heart or in heart. This is the way that Jesus describes his heart. But lowly and gentle, how? Because it requires a lowliness and gentleness of God's people to display the compassion of God to other people. I mean, you think about that for a second. I mean, God displayed his compassion for us in what way? Well, Paul describes it. He describes it in somewhere. In 2 Corinthians, thank you for shouting it out. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, it says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. You see, this is the heart of God. This is how it was displayed, that he would become poor, even though that he has all the riches. He would become poor on your behalf so that you, although you are poor, could become rich in Jesus Christ. It's a bit of a mind bender, but if you follow it, we could understand together that you are a poor man in desperate need of the riches of Christ, and not in some type of material way, but in the spiritual way that you are spiritually impoverished, and you are in desperate need of the richness spiritually of God himself, so that you might become the righteousness, all riches in Christ himself. This is the gift, the free gift of God. You See, the worst thing that you and I could do is understand this and then keep this as if no one else requires it or needs it or wants it. You see, for us who have Christ, 
We are to not only display the love of Christ, we are to give the love of Christ. This is why I love Compassion International so much. Because through this, through this ministry, through this partnership, you and I have a unique opportunity to share the love of Christ around the world. But here's why I love this partnership, because these are not just random children and, and that we hope for the best. Maybe we might meet them one day. Maybe we won't. I don't know. Maybe it's a real kid. Maybe it's not. Nobody really knows where these dollars are going. That is absolutely not the case of Compassion International. And here's what I love too, is that with this partnership, it's not random. It is strategic because uh, what Compassion did for this church family right here, Green Acres in Tyler, Texas, what they did for us is they went to the places that we are already going. So in the communities where we have church planting efforts right now in communities where we are planting seeds of the gospel of Jesus Christ, now compassion has come behind us and said, okay, here is how you can hear, help them, not just one time a year on short-term mission, but now year round, you are blessing this community and you are strengthening those churches that are trying to flourish in those areas. Don't you want to be a part of that? I mean, listen, here's what is incredible, and this is why I love this church body, because your concern, my concern, this church's concern is not just the healthiness of Green Acres, right? We don't want Green Acres to flourish. We want Green Acres to flourish in the likeness of Christ and the church down the street, Amen. That's not our enemy. That's not our competition. Those are our brothers and sisters in Christ and trying to build the same kingdom that is aimed toward the likeness of Christ. This is why we pray publicly for First Baptist Tyler, their pastor. We pray for South Spring. We pray for Central. We pray for our brothers and sisters around this community. Why? Because we believe in the partnering with local churches for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if we are for one another, then we are for him. And so we have to make sure that we keep the main thing the main thing. We have to be concerned about the lordship, the genuine lordship of Jesus Christ in the church. Not our church, but in the church. And one of the ways that we are going to help strengthen churches, not just here, but around the world, is just through this one partnership. That as we are running after church planning together, running after the gospel together, now you and I have an opportunity to take a child who belongs to that community, that church family, and now provide a hope that they never had. Just the hope of a meal, hope of education, hope of supplies, hope of medical care, all of these things. I wish, because if you're anything like me, then you might be a little bit skeptical of parachurch ministries. L listen, I get it. So am I. Listen, I'm saying this in front of our compassion guy right here. So Steve, sorry, brother, I'm a little skeptical. But then... I saw it firsthand. I was like, wait a second, those are actually real kids. And so I wish that you and I could get on a bus today, drive over to Colombia, drive over to Kenya, drive over to uh, Rwanda, drive over to Zambia, wherever we have partners, and to see the work of compassion. And so I checked on the, on the bus ticket, it's too expensive, you can't do it, okay? All right, it's impossible. And there's not a road that goes there. Okay, you with me? But instead of us trying to all go to Kenya, what, what the Lord opened up for us today is to have a little bit of Kenya come to us. And so will you give a Green Acres welcome to my brother right here, Owen, get up here, man. Thank you, brother. Here, have a seat, Owen. So Owen... Uh, is actually, he used to be a compassion kid. Somebody sponsored Owen, and, and we're going to get to talk about that. But before we get there, uh, man, will you just tell us who you are, your family, where are you from, all the good stuff, man. We want to hear it. We want to know Owen. Yeah. Uh, praise the Lord, church. 
Amen. Amen. So my name is Owen, Owen Gethanga, born and raised in Nairobi, Kenya. You're going to be quizzed on this, all right? Gethanga. Gethanga. Right, go, see? Yeah, Gethanga. And uh, I live in Colorado Springs, uh, married to my wife, and uh, we have uh, four kids, three boys, and finally we, we finally got our girl. And our beautiful family. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, we, me, me and my wife also, we sponsor three kids through Compassion. So we, we, we know, I, I was once a compassion kid, but I also believe in the ministry of compassion. That's part of the reason why we sponsor so that, you know, we can be able to impact the lives of those kids too as well. So you grew up in Kenya, in, in Nairobi, correct? Uh, so tell us, what, what was it like growing up in Nairobi? Tell us about your family growing up. Uh, because, and, and then we're going to get into some other things about your uh, life and the transition now, but... Uh, tell me about your family growing up in Nairobi. Yeah. So as a little boy, and I'm sure a lot of you can relate to this, I always wanted to become an accountant. <laughs> maybe, maybe That's not. That's the first time we've ever heard an accountant shout right there. <laughs> uh, amen. <laughs> you did it, Owen. <laughs> so yeah, uh, but then I found out that that would probably not happen because of a family that I was born in. And I'm, I was born in a family of three boys. My mom, who was, was a sole breadwinner, uh, she would make about 5 to $10 a month. And 5 to $10 a month is what you would call abject poverty. Woke up in the morning and, you know, we didn't have a fridge or electricity. Uh, and food was a huge problem. Getting just one meal a day was a problem. And so sometimes we had to go for days without food. And if you've gone for a day, more than a day without food, you become desperate. You do absolutely anything just to get food in your stomach, and including knocking on people's doors and, or sometimes, you know, going through trash to try and get food to eat. It wasn't a very good experience growing up and, you know, having to struggle for basic needs like water and, you know, the source of water that we had was not from taps, it was from rivers mm. and it was brown in color. And see, brown water doesn't taste good. It doesn't matter how much you boil it, but that's what we had to deal with. And it was, it was really difficult to just go through life with, you know, just with, with so little. And uh, one of the worst things, too, was that every time you got sick from either drinking that water or the food that you, eat, that you ate, right. uh, we didn't have, you know, the opportunity to be able to go to the hospital. So my mom would always tell us, when we get sick, just hope that what you have doesn't kill you. And mm -hmm. so that's kind of that's how we grew up with very little. And, but for me, it wasn't just the lack of food or the basic needs. It's the hopelessness that comes from yeah. poverty. It's what everybody around you echoed. And, you know, and when people constantly ask, you know, because we love to ask kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they ask me that question. And it's when I told them that I wanted to become an accountant, that they told me the reality is, is don't waste your time dreaming because none of your dreams will ever come true. Because mm -hmm. it's, you know, for me, it kind of seemed like, I was born in this family that we were trapped in a generational cycle of poverty that was just passed on from one generation to the next. So we, we have heard about that. I mean, if you study this, I mean, generational poverty is a big deal. But here you are now. What, what changed in your life? Yeah. What changed? Compassion. And compassion came to me uh, in the form of a church actually didn't know that I was sponsored by Compassion until I grew up and I actually realized that the organization that helped me was Compassion. Because to me, uh, my mom heard about this church. This church sent out an announcement and said, uh, Redeemed Gospel Church sent out an announcement in my community. And, you know, they, they were looking for kids to help. And, you know, we went to this church. We didn't know it was a Compassion Church. We just knew it was a church that we were going to get help from. And, you know, they, they have to make sure that the kids that really do need the help, you know, they do uh, home visits and questionnaires. Yeah. And uh, it didn't take very much convincing to, for me to get registered. And I got registered. One of the first things they did is they took a picture of me. and I think we have that picture uh, of you, of your compassion <laughs> uh, picture. Look, there's a little uh, Owen. No, that actually is one of our sponsored kids. Oh, that's not you. That's Don't Owen. we have you? Yeah. Where are you? 
I want to see Owen. There's Owen. Is That's that you? No Owen. Oh, gosh. <laughs> then you set me up for failure on this in front of the whole church. <laughs> that kid is a lot cuter than you anyways. So that, so. That. <laughs> <laughs> cool thing is that kid, his name is Junior. That kid goes to Redeemed Gospel Church. The church that okay, I went to. Okay, the same to. church. Okay. That, that's one of the kids that we sponsored through Compassion, wow. me and my wife. Amen. And so, like, the funny thing about my picture, too, is I had never taken a picture before. Well, we wouldn't know. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so, one of our friends played a trick on us at the camera, you know, the flash, because that yeah. was back in the day when there was no digital cameras. That The camera flash is really painful. And so, my first Compassion picture... I was probably terrified because I kept waiting for this pain that never seemed to arrive. But then, you know, we laughed about it later on. Uh, so my, my packet ended up in a church in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Wow. Like, what are the odds? The boy in Nairobi, Kenya. My packet ends up on a Sunday morning in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. A guy passes by, looks at the picture, and looks at the name. And the name of the kid is Owen, and his name is Owen. And he decides to sponsor me. And then starts this relationship where he would write me letters and, you know, and, and pray over me and encourage me. But for me, the difference was, you know, him talking to me about Jesus, but also the church talking to me about Jesus because I had no idea who Christ was until I started going to that church. Mm. But this church loved on me in a way I had never been loved on before. It's, and it, it just, like from the onset, I could tell there was something so different about these people that I had not seen before. And then I came, you know, I came to realize it was, you know, they loved Jesus so much just because compassion at the center of what compassion does is Jesus. I mean, from the first time I stepped foot into that church, these people would not shut up talking about Jesus. And I'm not kidding. And, but it was, it was the way they loved on us that, you know, for me, I wanted to, I wanted to have what they had. And, and so I remember one of, you know, one of the, one of the days, I think about a year or so into the program, I went, you know, I went to the church and I said to one of the teachers, you know, I've come to accept Jesus because I want to, I want, I want to surrender my life, but I want to see if what you guys say about this Jesus is really true. And, and so I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I did not know then, but I do know now, that that was the best decision I ever made to accept Christ as my Lord and Savior. Because, because the reality is that poverty left my life the day Christ came into my life. Mm. When I got Jesus, I got a hope that was way bigger than the poverty that I faced. See, every time I fought poverty by my own self, I ended up losing. But fighting poverty with Jesus was different. Mm. When I got Jesus, I got everything that I needed to get out of poverty. You know, one of the things that people do is they put a lot of emphasis on the, you know, the financial, physical aspects yeah. of poverty. Right. But poverty is a lot more spiritual and mental That's right. sometimes than it is physical. And while money is good, money can never get rid of poverty. But Jesus can because Jesus works from the inside out. That's all I needed. That was That's the right. difference. If compassion had just given me Jesus and told me to go my way, I would have been just fine. That's right. But compassion didn't stop there. They gave me food and clean water. It took me, you know, to hospital every time I got sick. They took me to school. Mm. I was the first person in my whole family to graduate high school. And then I went on, I uh, did my bachelor's degree. And guess what? Accounting. <laughs> and, yeah. And I loved it so much that I had to get my CPA. And so I'm a CPA in America. And, wow. Absolutely incredible. Yeah. And I mean, today I represent what compassion does. Yeah. I have been released from poverty in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, church, I wanted, I, I'm so, aren't you grateful that Owen got to come with us today? Because here's, here's what is special. Um, listen, all around this room, there's a packet that looks like this. And here's what I wanted us to realize together is that this is not just a face. This is not just a, 
a picture from Google or something like that. No, no, no. This is a real individual just like Owen made in the image of God himself who is in desperate need of the hope of Jesus Christ. And so this isn't random. This isn't just uh, some person far away, but rather this is somebody that we are being strategic with that we want to make sure with everything possible that they have a relationship with Jesus Christ and they have a relationship with somebody who cares. Because, Owen, I do want you to share quickly because uh, your sponsor is not just your sponsor. I mean, shed a little light on that. Yeah, and so, like, just from when he sponsored me, and he sponsored me because we shared the same name, and people sponsor because of so many different things. But, you know, we had an awesome relationship. He wasn't very much older than I was, and I used to call him big bro. He used to call me small bro. So when I got engaged, uh, one of the first calls that I wanted to make was to my sponsor because I wanted to ask him, you know, on our, you know, on our biggest day, if he would stand besides me. And, uh, and one of the awesome things is, you know, he said yes to be the best man in, in our wedding. And my sponsor, Owen, was the best man in our wedding. And I don't know if you have that picture. Up. Who, who knows, Owen? But. If that's really you. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> but that is, that is a picture of compassion. It's, you know, 20-some years ago, I was, I believe when, my packet ended up in, you know, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I wonder if people thought and wondered if I'm real. Yeah. If I was just a picture on a packet. But 20 some years later, I mean, look what the Lord can do. It just, the most amazing thing is not just that the generational curse and cycle of poverty has been broken in my life. Because, you know, poverty stops with me. My kids will never know poverty and the generations to come. It's, but it's also because I got to know Jesus. That's right. I got to take Jesus to my whole family. Amen. And so that one day in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, eternally changed not only my life, but the life of my whole family, the generations to come. But because I got to know Jesus, I get to take Jesus everywhere I go. And you know, right now, Compassion sponsors about 2.3 million kids. Wow. I don't know how, if you can imagine the impact that has on the kingdom. You know, they did, they did a survey and said that for every one child that gets sponsored, about seven or so people get impacted. Wow. But I mean, I can tell you from my life, so many people have come to know Jesus because somebody... 20-some years looked at a packet and said, I'm going to give this kid a chance. And, you know, just to bring it all full circle, uh, just God is, you know, God is, is amazing. Because about three years ago, I started working for Compassion as, guess what? They're an accountant. accountant. Yes. And, <laughs> and as a manager of accountant in, in, in Compassion, one of the things that I, you know, I was, I was, I was, I was crossing my fingers because, you know, there's the ministry out there, but also there's a ministry in, I, you know, I, I knew Compassion. They changed my life. I love Compassion. We sponsored three kids through Compassion. But I was like, I really hope their books are as clean as they look on the, out, on the outside. And one of the things I love Compassion even more, and this is a CPA speaking. You can quote me as a CPA. I love Compassion even more. Because of their financial integrity. Wow. They do what they say they do. Amen. Church, can you please help me thank Owen for being here with us today? Thank you, brother. Grateful for you. Yeah. And I wanted to be sure that, that you know uh, that these are real individuals that you and I get to invest in. And so I, I want to just ask everybody, if you would, right now, would you just stand up right where you are? And I'm gonna, we're going to sing uh, together in just a moment, but all around this room, uh, there's a packet at tables up in the balcony. You have uh, packets up there. Listen, I have been praying that this church family would sponsor over 800 kids. Do you think we can do that? Not very hopeful. Doesn't sound very helpful. Listen, I'm praying for that, that with all of our help together, that all of us together, that we could accomplish this goal. And this is what you're going to do, um, because it's going to require every single one of us 
you go and you grab a packet. And if you want to do it, uh, listen, the, the young person way, listen, I don't do that, okay? Um, but if you want to, all you have to do is scan the QR code right here on the front. It's going to take you through everything you need for this individual child. Now, here's the deal. There's only one packet per child, okay? So if you take this packet, make sure that you go through the steps, all right? And then you can uh, tear off the bottom portion, okay? Bottom portion, the third one, you tear that off, you can fill it out and then drop it in the buckets for this individual. But on the front right here, this is what I love about it. It tells you exactly where uh, Alan is. It tells you his birthday on August 26th of 2020. You know uh, about his family as you go through. On the back, you know what the needs are and you know everything about it. But here's what is awesome about this partnership. Because we are already investing where Alan is, now when we go on short-term mission trips, you get to go and say hey to Alan, and you get to see a face with who you're actually investing in. So this is what I want to ask you to do. During this time of response, I want you to go right now and just grab one of these packets. You can look through them and choose uh, which child that you want to sponsor, but they're at the tables. If you cannot move, if you're just physically unable to get out, listen, we're going to have uh, some some of our staff and some of our folks, uh, all you have to do is just raise your hand and they will bring a packet to you. You can walk through those steps, but make sure that we get this back, uh, this bottom part back in one of the buckets around. And I'm gonna ask that you go right now as we start worshiping. Listen, you go and get your, get your kids right now. Go ahead and move right now to the tables. Hey, I, I just wanna say thank you for investing in the kingdom, not just in your your tithes, your offerings, not just by sponsoring a compassion child, but in your time, your energy, everything that you do, your witness for him, that is an investment into the kingdom of God. And I am so grateful for a church that believes in building the kingdom of God. And so I just say, thank you. If you're visiting with us this morning, we're especially glad uh, that you came to worship with us this morning. And we pray that God is speaking to you through this church body. But I want to in invite you, listen, if you are visiting, listen, I would love to meet you out here at our Connection Suite. We have a gift that we would love to give you. Uh, those of you that are contemplating how to join this church family, maybe you're thinking about what does it really mean to have compassion and and to have the compassion of Christ in me. Listen, we want to help you walk through those decisions, whatever it is. And we want to help you take the next step. And so listen, church family, I want you to know that I love you. I am so grateful for you. And you are dismissed.